walking up here because it does list a special music with no name next to it. Should I just start singing? I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'll spare you that. <laughs> so we're good. It's my turn. Good. Hi, Tabernacle. I am so grateful to be here with you today. Um, my name is Jana Lee. Um, Macy already talked about me for a little bit, but I spent about 20 years in local church ministry, 10 of those in the Oregon Conference before joining the conference office team about two years ago. Um, and I now get to travel around, and I'm the children and family ministry director at the conference office, and that means I get to travel around Oregon and southwest Washington talking and connecting with churches and helping them connect with kids and families in their communities, and I, I just... I'm having a blast. I love it so much. I love seeing our unique ministry places and the different things the churches are doing. Let's start with another word of prayer, and then I'll, I'll jump right in. Lord, thank you for the chance to come and worship together today. Let your spirit live in us today as we, as we think about what you would have for us to do for you. Amen. So I, um, oh, you know what? I left my clicker over here. I'm a pastor's kid turned pastor. You might know a few of those around here. Um, and so there was plenty of moving, not as much as some in my, in my life, and plenty of moving churches. And through that time, and now that I'm traveling around as I am, the thought that I have processed and found myself processing recently was, what is home? What makes something home? And I've kind of crossed, like, thought about that. Um, I, have, I am very, very blessed. I'm trying to remember what my next slide is. Let me just remember what I gave you guys. Um, I have an amazing... Is it not on? Did I not turn it on? There, now it's, now it's doing the buzz thing. That's what you wanted. There we go. Home sweet home. There it is. <laughs> I am very, very blessed. I have an amazing husband. I have two teenage sons. I, the whole teenage parenting thing, I often like to joke that I think everything past, like, newborn stage for my children has been a surprise to me. Like, oh, they just keep going. They keep growing. Um, and I, there is a lot to be said for the teenage stage that I didn't fully expect because they are kind of, they kind of get past needing attention for all sorts of other things, and they can be your friends. And uh, it's a pretty special time when they're not also being difficult teenagers, but that's part of the joy of it. And they, I'm sure, would have uh, similar words for when I'm being a difficult mother. So we, we do, we manage it well through the ups and downs. And so I've thought about that because my kids, in the unusualness of being pastor's kids, have been in one community most of their lives. Um, we were one in three, they were, they were one in three when we joined the Meadowglade Church community, and we still live there because I can travel around from there, and they have school there and everything. And so for them, home is very much one church in one place, and it kind of shocked their system when I said, I'm not going to be at this place anymore, I'm going to travel around. And they said, but, but what about church? And I was like, that could still be your church, and it could still be my church. I'm just going to be other places, and you can come with me or stay there. They're old enough to make those choices. And it kind of shocked their system because they'd never known me to travel around, um, unlike many pastor families. It's been a huge blessing. So it made me kind of start asking, what is home? What makes home? Recently, I had the chance to travel to one of my homes, La Sierra University Church. Well, and La Sierra. So I spent a lot of my childhood around the La Sierra community because um, when my dad was a pastor at a few different churches, the way that conference is set up, there's a lot of churches in a small area because there's so many people. So you can live in one place and go to one school. So my dad was at three different churches in my childhood, but we mostly stayed here until about high school. And so I was able to take, that's my oldest son next to me, the curly-haired boy there. Um, he has a lot of hair, and he, he's rather proud of it. So, <laughs> so I was able to take him back with me to visit my grandma, who still, she is 93 and still lives independently on, in, her, in the house that my dad grew up in, about two miles from the La Sierra University Church. 
So I was able to take him back to visit with me last April. And so we go pick her up. She's not driving anymore, thankfully. Um, and we, we go to the church, and he walks her in, and her eyesight isn't what it used to be. And so he, he makes the comment that getting her from the car to the church took the same amount of time, and back again was the same amount of time as, like, the church service itself. Um, very, very, you know, got to move with her grandma. But I loved that because he was perfectly happy to do it. It was a great chance to connect. So we're walking, La Sierra University Church is quite a tall church, if any of you have ever been there. There's a lot of steps involved. And so we go up and we come to the side, and my grandma's good with steps, straight up and down is, is, well, we didn't have her go down those steps, but going up was okay. And so we get to the top of the steps, and I notice that the greeter at the door is wearing quite a few, like, tags and, like, words, and as I look at it, I realize that I have shown up on alumni weekend. <laughs> and I graduated from last year university. So for high school I left and I went other places, but I decided to come back and finish. So I was actually back at church for my own alumni weekend. <laughs> and I didn't know and I thought it was kind of funny. So we're sitting there and we walk in and it is a wonderful community there. And the person who, the next person we see happens to be the alumni director who is also somebody who just checks in on my grandma regularly because she's just a wonderful human. Her name's Candace Jorgensen, and I will sing her praises up and down and left and right if anybody knows her. She's wonderful because she just, out of the goodness of her heart, all of us family have moved away from my grandma. My grandma has refused to move, and so she, other people check on her, and I'm so grateful for our Avenus community there. So Candace sees us and she says, come sit with me, because as the alumni director, she has to, she's also one of the church worship coordinators, so she's involved. So she pulls us to the very front row of the La Sierra University Church on alumni weekends. You have all these people there and there's all these platform participants and there's me and my grandma sitting up there. And so people are kind of looking at us like, oh, are you involved in the service today? I was not. So there we are sitting on the front row of the La Sierra University Church. My son refuses to smile for pictures. And we're sitting next to um, the lead pastor, that's Icky Tiny. I went to college with him. And so it's funny that he is now, it's really funny when you go to college and they become the you know, lead pastors of these big churches. And then the speaker for the day, which is also funny to me, is next to Pastor Icky, and it's Dick Dirksen, because he's a La Sierra alumnus. And I thought it was really funny that I had to travel, he had just retired from the conference office. And I thought it was a little bit amusing that I had to go to Southern California and still get to hear Dick Dirksen share his stories. So it ended up being a really special Sabbath. So I'm sitting there, and I start thinking, this church feels like home. Why is that? Why does this church of all churches that I was a part of feel like home? My dad did pastor there, but I was quite young. So it wasn't the church that I spent the most of my childhood at. It wasn't even the church that I had my youth years at where you got to do youth group things. I didn't spend long amounts of time there. Why did this church, of all my churches, if I had to pick a home church, why did La Sierra feel like that for me? So I'm sitting there thinking about it, and I realized that in junior high, this church allowed myself and my other junior high friends to independently put on a Vespers program that they all showed up to. No adults involved. We put on a full, in junior high, a fully kid-developed Vespers program, and the church showed up for it. When I was in college, when I came back my last two years of college, they, had, they asked me um, to come be a youth intern to work with the youth pastor, and then the youth pastor took another job, and they were without a youth pastor, and they said, Jana can do it. And they let me youth pastor while they were in a, in a search for others. This you know, big university church could have gone a lot of other ways and was like, no, this is a great chance for us to include uh, one of our theology students. So I came, I youth pastored there, and as a part of that, they invited me as a part of staff meetings. And there's, you know, five, uh, there were seven or eight pastors on staff, and you add a few auxiliary people, and they were like, no, we want, you get to come and be a part and be in the inner circle of, of pastors because you're here, you're one of us, even though you're young. And in that part of that process, they ordained me and a few of my other friends who were highly involved at that church as elders, even though we're college students. This was a church that just made me feel seen, known, and loved. 
And there's something absolutely incredible about a church that makes you feel like that. We have been talking a lot around the conference in the past year about the term community. What is it to be community? And here's something that we know. They've done studies over churches and what makes a healthy church. And they've done studies that show what makes young people stay in church. Oh, not yet. And one of the key factors, and I am a broken record. If you've ever heard me, I will talk about this till I'm blue in the face because I believe in it so strongly. But one of the things that we know make for a healthy church and have kids who grow up and embrace the beliefs and values in, of their church family is warmth, is loving relationships. This is the thing. The church that made me feel warm and le- welcome was my home church. The quote is this, children from families and communities that are perceived as relationally warm are more likely to grow up to consider and embrace the beliefs and values of their parents. It's a little awkward worded, but that's the quote. This is a study done of 35 family, wait, sorry, over 35 years of 300 families. 300 families, 35 years, the tipping point for whether those children grew up and wanted to be a part of faith communities that, that they had been raised in was if they were perceived as relationally warm. I believe in this so very strongly. It is so important that we think about this. We often want, we, we look around and we think we want our young people in church. We want our kids. I, I spend a lot of time thinking about this as a young pastor when my kids were little. How do I, how do I raise kids who want to be a part of this church? And we have the answer. And it's, are we relationally warm? So, I am here today, and I like to do a little something different when I speak. And here's the thing. It's going to involve you guys. So take a minute, process the fact that you're going to get involved. Let that settle on your shoulders for a minute, because I know we're not used to that. And uh, you've got a pretty great pastor. I'm sure she makes you get out of your comfort zone periodically. (laughs) Um, so you're going to get a little out of your comfort zone. I'm going to try and make it manageable, but just kind of process that for a second. Here's the deal. If you hate this, it's just this week. You just have to tolerate it for the next 20 or so minutes, and then you're done. If you like it, think about if you want to incorporate things like this in other ways. Process what you liked about it and what could be good for your church family here. It doesn't have to look just like this. Because... Here's why we're doing it. There's a reason that I'm doing this, and it's not just because I like to get people involved. That helps, and that's wonderful. But we look at young people these days, and we sometimes think to ourselves, they just want to be on screens all the time. And that's partly true. But when you dig a little deeper, you'll notice something. Most of us grew up with some level of screens in our lives, right? We are now of generations. Most of us had TVs in our homes. When we came to watch the TV, you sat and watched, sat and watched. And our churches are set up in a sit and watch like environment. One thing we know about young people, have you ever been next to a one-year-old and had your phone in your hand? What do they do? Do they sit and watch it? They grab at it. They touch the screen. They engage with it. Our young people, they know at very young ages that this isn't something to watch. This is something to interact with. Our young people actually like interaction. It's the way they are used to engaging with the world. I'm not saying they'll love exactly what I'm doing today, but I am saying as we think about our young people, about our children, And what they might want and feel warmth in in a church community, it's likely not a sit and watch scenario. They're going to feel more warmth when they're interacted with. So today, since I'm the Children and Family Ministries Director and I get to do this, we're going to do a little bit of interacting with each other and back and forth. And I really enjoy this. It's, It's fun to do. And like I said, we'll just have to tolerate it for a little while, see what you think of it. So 
We're going to start easy. Now, I want to encourage you, you don't have to get up and move and change your comfortable seating much. I know we have our seats. I wouldn't want to mess with that. All right. But you do want to have, be near-ish somebody you can talk to. And I really encourage it to be somebody of a different generation than you, if you can turn in your seat and talk. But if you want to stay where you are next to somebody, I'm not forcing anything, all right? Just challenging you a little bit to find, find someone to talk to near you, especially if they're of a different generation. Okay, I'm going to start pretty easy on you. When you were young or as a young person now, I'm not the one to decide where that line is. Let me be very clear. What part of church felt the most warm. Take a couple minutes and talk to each other. When you were young or as a young person, what part of church feels the most warm to you? Talk amongst yourselves. Make sure to give others in your group a chance to share if they haven't yet. We'll do this in about another minute. All right. Anybody willing to share so, what you loved, what made you feel warm in church or what somebody in your group said? Anybody willing to share? Yes. Okay. Yeah, a missionary a program for involvement. I think, I don't know if that was, I know that's what the program has, but I think yeah. So getting involved in ministry was kind of what you're saying, like val being valued as a young person and being active in service. Excellent. What else? What made you feel warm in church? Yes. Okay, so again, more involvement, getting, getting involved in part of the service that made you feel most warm and welcome. What others? Anybody else want to share? You don't have to. I won't make you. But you can share what he said. What they, what, can you share what they shared? Sabbath school. Sabbath school, time for your own age group to talk to other people. Wonderful. Any others want to share? Yes. So knowing others and feeling known. Yep. Having a person who really makes you feel special and loved and known. That one-on-one -on -one relationship. You guys are answering things that are actually highly researched. I love it. Yes. So connecting in service. Con Uh -huh. and social, connecting in service and connecting socially. Oh, I'm going to stop there, but you guys have named so many good things, and I love it because 
honestly, a lot of these are the things in research. That's one of my favorite quotes that one of my life mentors would always say. Um, in church, what people really want is to know others, to be known, and have a purpose. Like that, that sums it up. Um, and I, I think that is so true. Pastor Macy, um, when I do this at churches, oh, she's being mom for a minute. What, un, no one ever says the sermon. Just putting that out there. Sometimes my, my challenge that I will throw out to you is if these are the things that make us feel the most loved and warm, again, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't matter exactly which activity. Sometimes we'll hold on to the activity, but get underneath of it and think like that connection and service with others. It can look differently for different generations. If we know this is the major factor in kids growing up to, to know Jesus, to want to follow Jesus for life, to take our values, where do we put our time and energy? Where do we put our time and energy? Hold that thought for a minute. When I look at the Bible and I look at the idea of home, what made people feel like that warm home? One of, my, one of the stories that comes to mind is Ruth and Naomi. So what we have is this very tragic story of Naomi who has left home and lost her family. Now, I am the mom. I'm the wife of a husband and the mom of two boys, so I don't dwell in this story very long because the idea is beyond earth-shattering and heartbreaking because she lost her husband and lost her two sons in a faraway land and was left alone at the stage of life where she was supposed to be safe and taken care of. Her adult sons were grown. She was supposed to be in this stage of, of joy and being taken care of and grandchildren and all the things, and it's just gone. And what happens is she thinks, what do I want to do now? I want to go home. I just want to go home. And in the process of going home, her daughter-in-law says, I'll come with you. So they formed that bond relationship that we've talked about here. There's a bond relationship that the daughter-in-law, Ruth, says, I want to be with you. That matters more to me than location. Home isn't about location. And Naomi feels confident in her home base that they will accept this other race, other religion, other everything person as one of their own. She trusts her home enough to bring an other in. I love that story. I love the, how Ruth comes and joins this home base and she is welcomed as one of the family. Some people resist it and you can see it throughout the story. There's some tension there. What happens when somebody from the outside comes in? But key people step up and welcome Ruth as one of their own. And Ruth becomes one of the ancestors of David, one of the ancestors of Jesus. It's an amazing story. Another story like that that I love is the story of, I'm going to go with Elisha. I'm pretty positive I'm right on that one. Elisha, not Elijah. Um, and the upper room, where there's a family that he stops in. And Elisha travels all around. I get that. He's always off and around. He doesn't have his own base. And one family sees him and says, he needs home. We're building a room just for him, no strings attached. We don't have an expected amount of time that he comes here, what he'll pay, that he'll pay attention to us. We're just giving him, we see him, and we're giving him a space to rest, to be himself, to recover. When I look at the life of Jesus, there is a particular family that he seems most at home with. We see it multiple times in the Gospels of Jesus, and it's Mary and Martha and Lazarus. His interactions with them are slightly different than everyone else, and it really does look as if he feels most at home there. So, that's our next group question. What warm characteristics do you see in their story that made Jesus feel at home with them. The texts, the, the major texts, if you want to look it up, to look for anything, is John 11 and Luke 10, 38 to 40. So go ahead in your groups again, look at the story of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and ask what made Jesus feel at home? What do you see in the stories that made Jesus 
feel most at home, most warm with this family? Take a few minutes to talk. About another minute, we'll start talking about it. All right, is anybody willing to share some of what your group came up with? What are some of the warm characteristics that we see in this story that made Jesus feel so at home with them? So they, they had him like, like a brother, like in their home with them. Um, I, I love that. Like, this is, hey, Jesus, you can come in here. We'll take care of you. We'll feed you. We'll talk with you. Like, it's part of the family. What else? What do you see? They were real. I love that. I love that they fight in front of him, right? Like they're not putting on a show. They, they let themselves out. And I think Jesus was like, thank you for that. I know that the, the smiley, happy, welcoming feasts that he normally got invited to, he knew that wasn't all, he knows people. He knew that wasn't all there was, but people would put up their, only their best, and they were like, nah, Jesus, you get all of us. I love that. What else do you notice? Yes. Mm-hmm. Ooh. She was just open to Jesus, listened, gave him her attention and care. And Jesus, I mean, I imagine that just fed Jesus' soul with all the things that he had to go do to have somebody who just genuinely heard him. I love that. Yes. They trusted him. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. I think double trust is going on there. I see a trust in that like they knew he could have fixed Lazarus. They trusted his abilities. But they also trusted him enough to share their frustration with him. That they weren't afraid to say, I disagree with the choice you made here. <laughs> you chose not to come here, and that's not cool, Jesus. To, dis to have a relationship where you can trust that a disagreement isn't going to kill the relationship. That's a, that's a level, of, that's a deep trust that is hard to find. Any others? Yes. No expectations. Jesus could just show up. The Lazarus story, they had a little expectation, but in the other stories, we just see they wanted time with him. That was what they, they most desired, and for him to feel at home, and I love that. That's excellent. When we think about church now and warmth now, often the question we get is, how do we get young people to come back to church or to come to church? And I want to challenge you, Tabernacle. Building relationships like we're building them with Jesus. When we go to somebody and we listen to them, no strings attached. Jesus is very, very clear in Scripture. When we do something for others, it's not hypothetically doing something for Jesus. It is literally doing something for Jesus. Showing up, listening, caring, no strings attached. Building warm relationships is the way forward. I deeply believe that, lo that in a divided... Do you guys know society's divided right now? Is that news? Have you noticed? Anybody else? I deeply believe that local church family is possibly the key answer to the divided society, when we behave in this way, when we relationally build with each other, no strings attached, and listen to each other. People can get sermons online, right? You can get Bible studies online. I love those things in person. I'm not saying it's the same, but they're technically possible. But that deep, warm, connected relationships, the ones you remember from growing up, the ways you enjoy, you don't get those from home. But it takes an intentional connection and a relationship, and for somebody to feel how they feel, truly loved, no strings attached. I think that's what our churches are called to be and to do, and that is the way forward for our churches. And so I want to think about that, your church. We're going to talk about the first one. I want you to think about it for yourself and for your church. Just, on, just focus on the first one right now. What is one way our community shows relational warmth to others? Talk about it amongst each other. What do you guys think you're doing really well right now? Our churches are doing well at lots of things. What is it that you love about Tabernacle that you're doing well, that is, that is doing this kind of work, that relational warmth that matters so much? Talk to each other. What do you love about Tabernacle? Anybody want to share? What do you love about your home church? Yes. The people. Oh, that's huge. The people you get to connect with. Yes. Tykes and tacos. 
connecting with people your age over food. We didn't mention the food part of the Mary and Martha story, but I think that that is a huge part of it. Yes, what? Friends. Friendship. You guys do friendship well. That is beautiful, especially if your young people see that you do friendship well. Well done. Yes. Compliments. People say nice things. Like we talked about the words in children's story. That is wonderful. Compliments. You guys build your young people up. This is excellent. What else do you see? What do you love about your church? Yes. Oh, connecting in between at home. Lovely. Connecting groups. That is excellent. I'm not going to have you talk about the, last, the next question. I do ask you to think about it because we can always grow, right? And I don't mean numbers. I mean internally and as a church family. There's always growth that can be done. And so I challenge you to think for yourself, what might feel cold and distant for somebody? What might, when somebody comes in, what, what might help somebody feel more warm? And is there a relationship in your own life that maybe you could grow in warmth, reach out to, to listen to somebody no strings attached, and make sure they feel warm and loved and connected. Because Jesus loves them and you love them too. No ulterior motives, just because you care. I think that is the calling of the Christian church today, the Adventist church today. That is your calling, Tabernacle, is in a divided world, reach out and listen and build relationships, no strings attached. This is the way forward, and I believe we can do this, church family. Let's bow our heads for prayer. God, you have loved us no strings attached, and you've built relationship with us. You are a relational God who desires relationship with us and through us. So we ask that you live through us as we go from here to reach out to someone, to make sure they know that they're loved by us, and to grow this church in warmth and love that's already doing so many good things that we can continue to grow and share your love with others. Thank you.